Uh, my name is Bart, Bart Schutz. Uh, people earlier were asking me where I'm from, so I'll give you the answer I gave them. I am from my mother's womb. Anybody else? Yes, I hope everybody. Uh, no, I am from Tallahassee, Florida, and uh, that's right down the road uh, by plane. And uh, I'm excited for what we're going to do here. Um, just a quick introduction about myself, and then I'm going to give a minute for us to get to know each other real quick. So I am married um, to my wife, Brooke. We've been married for 25 years. Yes. She's a very lucky woman. <laughs> yeah. I'm a lucky man. And uh, she's been interceding for me last night. I was a little stirred up with stuff, and she was sharing things with me, encouraging me this morning, praying with me and encouraging me. Um, I'm a blessed man. We have four children together, three girls and a boy. Our oldest, Hannah, is 24. Uh, Gabrielle is about to be 22 in two weeks. Kaylee just graduated high school. She's 18. And then our baby boy is Joshua. He's almost my, almost my height. He's 15. And uh, love my kids. And uh, the only part I don't like about traveling and doing ministry is being away from them. But when I'm home, I am fully home. And uh, just love my family. But let me do this. Uh, I'm assuming, is there anyone in here that knows everybody in the room? Raise your hand if you know everybody in the room. I'm putting mine down. So do me a favor. Just the people to your right, your left, if you don't know them, just introduce yourself. Just give them your name and where you're from. We'll do this real quick. All right, that's enough now. We want to get to know, get to know each other, but not that well. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to have a, a combination of some teaching and some interaction. We'll have some activity. We'll be praying with each other. So we're going to get comfortable with each other uh, even more so. But before I start, I like to start pretty much every event that I do with these catechism quotes. So paragraph 2670 and 2671. This is my secret sauce. 2670, 2671. 2670 says this. The church invites us. Now that in itself is huge. The church invites us to call upon the Holy Spirit every day. Not every other day. The church invites us to call upon the Holy Spirit every day, before and after every important action. Let's nuance this a moment. What are some important actions in your day? Give me some answers. Work. Getting out of bed. Taking care of people. Prayer. Conversations with kids. Did I hear parenting? Taking a shower. That's important. Even going to the bathroom. Eating. Going to bed. How about breathing? Anyone find that important? <laughs> So basically what the church is saying to you and I is that we are to call upon the Holy Spirit always, always, all day, every day, always. 2671 goes on to say, the simplest, and I like that because I'm simple, the simplest and most direct prayer is also traditional. I love that language too. Do you guys know what that prayer is? The simplest and most direct prayer that's also traditional? Come Holy Spirit. You guys are good. Come Holy Spirit. And then it goes on to say what? Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of the faithful, and enkindle within them the fire of your love. And you guys are probably familiar with this one too. St. Bonaventure. What does he say? St. Bonaventure says the Holy Spirit comes where he is loved. The Holy Spirit comes where he is invited. The Holy Spirit comes where he is expected. So this time we have together now and this evening is only going to be as good as the Holy Spirit is present. He is the secret sauce. You know, the Holy Spirit, it says in 696, the very bottom of 696, do not quench the Holy Spirit. 
It's like cutting off the water on a hose. The Holy Spirit longs to have his church back. So let's do this. Let's stand up. And let's just do what the church says. And just say with me, come Holy Spirit. Again, come Holy Spirit. A third time, come Holy Spirit. If you're willing, ask the person next to you if you can place their hand on your shoulder. Please ask. And if they say yes, place your hand on their shoulder. Everybody linked up? All right, we're going to pray for the people next to you or the person next to you, depending on however it worked out for you. Let's pray into 2671. Say, come Holy Spirit. Fill the hearts of your faithful. And enkindle within them the fire of your love. Let's pray into St. Bonaventure's words. You all ready? Say with me, Holy Spirit, we love you. Holy Spirit, we invite you. Holy Spirit, we expect you. And one more. Holy Spirit, be with this guy from Tallahassee. Because <laughs> we want you. Amen. All right, give somebody a high five, grab a seat, and we'll get started. So what we're going to get here is uh, it's a smorgasbord of an event that I do, which is a two-day event called Day of Equipping, actually now called Equipping the Saints, that we're calling here Equipped for Sainthood. And so we're going to take two hours worth of material, and we're going to squeeze it into an hour, and it's going to be nothing but teaching for an hour straight. Nope, not true. I'm going to give some brief little teaching, and then we're going to do some activation and interaction and prayer with one another. Okay, you all ready for this? Yeah. All right. So, equipped for sainthood. What is sainthood? Well, of course, we all know sainthood is like that hall of fame of heaven, right? Those guys that have been canonized. Those are saints. Is that the only definition of saint? Nope. The church and scripture, actually, from what I've understood, there's three categories of saints. There's those who have been canonized which I'm hoping some of you guys will be there one day. Then there's those who are in heaven considered to be saints. And then there's those the Scripture refers to as just the believers in Jesus' saints. So Paul, when he would address his letters, he would say to the church in Corinth, to the saints, to the saints in Ephesus, to the saints in Philippi. And there he's referring to the followers of Jesus Christ. I'll read one of them to you. It's in 1 Corinthians 1, 2. Paul says, To the church of God that is in Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. So the sainthood that we're referring to right now, today, is you, the followers of Jesus Christ, those who are living in the mission of Jesus Christ. So mission, what do I mean by mission? Well, as I referenced last night as I was introducing this, John 14, 12. One day I was just reading through my Bible, just doing my daily readings, going through the book of John. And I came upon John 14, and I'm just reading through, honestly just checking a box, getting done with my reading so I can get on to work. And the Holy Spirit caught me. And as I'm going through and I read John 14, 12, it says, Truly, truly, he who believes in me will do the things that I've done, will do the works that I have done. And I paused there, and I went like, what is he talking about? This was years ago. And it's like the Holy Spirit says, go back and read that again. What is Jesus really saying there? Truly, truly. First of all, if Jesus says truly, he means it's true. If he says it's twice, it's really true. So what he's saying is, guys, this is really the truth here. If you believe in me... You'll do what I've done. That is quite a statement. What did Jesus do? Well, not much. <laughs> he just forgave the sins of the sinner. He had compassion. He loved. He had mercy. He obeyed his parents. <laughs> that alone is great. But Jesus would cast out demons. 
He would preach in the synagogue the good news of the kingdom. He even confronted the, the Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees. But Jesus, after his baptism, when the Holy Spirit descended upon him, for the next two and a half years, it was signs, miracles, and wonders. Where the blind would see, and the deaf would hear, and the lame would walk. Even the dead were raised. Lazarus, come forth. So when the scripture is saying to you, when Jesus is saying to you, and I hope when you read this, you put your name in there. Truly, truly, Bart, if you believe in me, you're going to do what I've done. You're going to love like I love. You're going to share the good news like I share the good news. You're going to forgive sinners of their sin. You're going to lay hands on the sick, and they're going to be healed. That's radical. It's not that radical for you guys, but for a lot of the church, and as I travel around, I travel two times a month. This is radical. And this is what Jesus meant by his mission. It has invited you and I to do the things that he did. What does the church say about the mission of Jesus Christ? 871. The Christian faithful, that's you. Say, I'm the Christian faithful. The Christian faithful are those, in as much as they have been incorporated in Christ through baptism, have been constituted as the people of God. Say, we're the people of God. For this reason, since they have become sharers in Christ's priestly, prophetic, and royal office in their own manner, they are called to exercise the mission which God has entrusted to the church to fulfill in the world in accord with the condition proper to each one. You and I have been invited as the faithful Christians, followers of Jesus Christ, as the people of God, to live into the mission of God, to live into the mission of Christ, to fulfill the mission of Christ. Here's a radical one for you. Catechism 6, 795. 795. I suggest you read these. And hopefully you guys got some notes, right? So you can study this for yourself. But this is quoting St. Augustine in 795. says this, Let us rejoice then and give thanks that we have become not only Christians, but Christ himself. Do you understand and grasp, brethren, God's grace towards us? Marvel and rejoice. We have become Christians. Christ. That's a bold statement. Marvel and rejoice, we have become Christ. For if he is the head, we are the members. He and we together are the whole man, the fullness of Christ. Then is the head and the members. Head and members, as it were, one and the same mystical person. You don't have a body that doesn't have a head. You don't have a head that doesn't have a body. So I don't know about you guys. These last couple years have been a little crazy, haven't they? I don't know about you, but sometimes I'll sit there and I'll go, God, why don't you intervene? You're sovereign. Why don't you intervene with all that's going on right now? Why don't you intervene? And it's like one time in my prayer, this thought just hit me, and it was like, yeah, Bart, I'd like to, but I need a body. Marvel and rejoice. You. Let me read it exactly. Marvel and rejoice. We have become Christ. He is the head. We are the body. We are called to live into the mission of Jesus Christ. If you're wanting the world to see Christ, if you're wanting God to show up on the scene, then he says, great, let's go do it. Let's go. I need a body. He's invited you and I to live into his mission. Catechism 1294, and this will segue us into the next section when we'll have some interactive things that we'll do. 
1294 says this, by confirmation, we're all familiar with confirmation, by confirmation, Christians, that is, those who are anointed. Why does the church say Christians, those who are anointed? What does the word Christ mean? Anointed one. So as Christians, you're anointed. You are in Christ. By confirmation, Christians, those who are anointed, share more completely in the mission of Jesus Christ, in the fullness of the Holy Spirit with, with which he is filled, so that their lives may give off the aroma of Christ. What aroma is the world experiencing when they get around Christians? Are they experiencing the aroma of Christ? I've put off a lot of aromas in my life, amen? But my goal now is the aroma of Christ. I have a friend. He walks into a New Age store on a semi-regular basis to go buy some cashews or some walnuts or something. And he'll purposely walk in there praying up and down the road. But he's not being weird about it. He's not praying out loud. He's just under his breath. And he's just praying for the aroma of Christ. Or the way he puts it, he prays. He's, he walks down the aisle and he says, Holy Spirit, just leak. Holy Spirit, just leak. But it's all under his breath. And he's done this for months, for years. Walks up and down the aisle, acts like he's looking at things, goes by his, his cashews or whatever. Holy Spirit, leak. So one day he's walking up to the counter, and the young lady behind the counter, as soon as he walks up there, she starts to cry. And he acts like he doesn't understand what's going on. He's just purchasing his cashews. And she says, I don't know what it is about you, but every time you come in here, I feel something. Oh, I, I don't know. <laughs> We're called to leak. <laughs> we are called to put off the aroma of Christ. So let's talk about confirmation. I would usually take about an hour just to talk about this alone, but I'm going to do this in five or ten minutes. But you have it in your notes there, and I encourage you to, to look this up. And if you teach confirmation, I beg you, please, please institute this. Because this is what the church says confirmation is. 1286, 1287, 1288, and then 1302, which we'll read in a minute. I'm just going to try to summarize these for you. 1286 is basically saying that the Old Testament spoke of the hope for Messiah. That we would, you would know the Messiah because he would be the one who would be baptized and the Holy Spirit would descend upon him. That his whole life and his whole mission were in complete unity with the Holy Spirit. 1287 talks about it wasn't just for Christ but for all the Messianic people. Messianic as in Jesus Christ, the Messiah, Christians. And it was for all the Messianic people. Thus, John 14, 12. He who believes in me will do the things that I've done. And so it's for you. And then 1288 goes on to say it wasn't just for them, but it's, it's, it's for the days to come, which is now. And it would say that in the early church, when they would lay hands upon the believers when they went house to house, they would ask them, they would say, have you received the baptism of the Holy Spirit? And often they would say, and this is in Acts 5 and other places, well, we received the baptism from John. They said, well, the baptism from John was for repentance. But John said, and this is in Matthew 3.11, there's one coming after me who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. More on that tonight. And so they would say, no, we haven't received that. So they would say, would you like to be baptized in the Holy Spirit? And they said, yes. And so they would lay hands upon them. This is all through the book of Acts. And they would receive the Holy Spirit. Well, the church says in 1288 that that origin in the book of Acts the, of the apostles, when they would lay hands upon them, that is the origins of confirmation. What happened when the bishop, some cases the priest, when you were confirmed, what did the bishop do? You laid, your, laid hands on your head, right? 
blessed you, anointed you with oil, blessed you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and said, receive the Holy Spirit, receive the seal of the Holy Spirit, right? So what the church is saying in 1288, that when the bishop does that, we find its origins way back here 2,000 years ago in the book of Acts, when the apostles would do this. And this was after Pentecost. And then when they would lay hands upon them and say, receive the Holy Spirit, it says they would prophesy and speak in other tongues. And then they would go out and they would pray for people and they began doing the things that Jesus did. You remember John and Peter, they were just going for their daily prayer and there was a guy begging. And they said, hey, silver and gold, we have none. But what we have, the Holy Spirit, we give to you. Get up and walk. And this man who I picture with no legs, I don't know, it's just how I picture it, an invalid, stands up and walks. I can just hear the bones popping as he's getting up to walk. And the people are astonished. And this is happening all through the book of Acts. Philip, it says, because of the signs, miracles, and wonders, people were cut to the heart. And they would, they would cry out, what must we do to be saved? Acts 2, 42 to 47. It says they gathered together daily for the apostles' teaching. They had all things in common. They broke bread in one another's homes. And signs, miracles, and wonders happened among them daily. And thousands were added on to them daily. Let me ask you all something. Are we seeing thousands added on to the church daily? Are we seeing signs, miracles, and wonders daily? Now, you guys might be able to say yes. But overall in the church, nope. Statistics say, and you guys probably know this better than me, what is it, 74% of young people who've been confirmed Catholic leave the church by the time they're 24? That's a tragedy. As a friend told me, if this was a business, we'd close its doors. But it's not a business. It's the house of God. And the remnant will always remain, and the church will always prevail. But we got a little bit of a problem. So everywhere I go, I teach on this about confirmation. And let me say what 1302 says. It is evident from its celebration that the effect of the sacrament of confirmation is the special outpouring of the Holy Spirit as once granted to the apostles on the day of Pentecost. Were you taught that at confirmation class? I was not. 1302 of the teachings of the church says that confirmation is the same outpouring of the Holy Spirit that happened on the day of Pentecost. So everywhere I go, whether I have a crowd of 20 people or a crowd of 1,000 people, I ask this question that I'm going to ask you. And it's pretty much the same answer. I have a feeling it's going to be higher here. But th- so I'm talking about at your confirmation. When the bishop lays hands on you and said, receive the Holy Spirit. How many of you at your confirmation, was it like Pentecost? Raise your hand. One, two, three. Am I missing some? That's amazing. I wish you guys could travel with me. That's the number. Three to five. Three to five people experienced what the church says confirmation is intended to be. Anyone else see a problem with that? And as I ask the priests, and I ask my friends here, I I know both of them, Is there a problem with the sacrament, Father? Yes. (laughs) Would you say there's a problem with the sacrament, Father? So you're both right, right? Not really the sacrament themselves, but however, perhaps the way we're practicing it. Catechism 2111, you can write this down. Catechism 2111. It says, to attribute prayer and or sacraments to their mere external form, apart from the interior disposition, is to fall into superstition. Let me say that again. To attribute prayer and or sacramental signs to their mere external performance, apart from the interior disposition, is to fall into superstition. 25, I think it's 2563, you can look it up yourself. Um, It talks about the heart. The heart is the place to which I would would draw. The heart is the place of 
life or death. The heart is the place of decision. The heart is the place of encounter. The heart is the interior disposition. So I think the problem is, it's not so much, as you guys are saying, it's not so much in the sacraments as in what the church has passed down, but somehow in the practice of, and maybe the teaching of, I don't, I don't really know, as it relates to confirmation. But somehow we're not getting and living fully into what the church says we are intended to have through confirmation. Because the church says in 1302, I read again, it is evident from its celebration that the effect of the sacrament of confirmation is the special outpouring of the Holy Spirit as once granted to the apostles on the day of Pentecost. So let me ask you this, and I think this number is going to go up vastly here. How many of you since confirmation have received what the church is saying here, and maybe they called it baptism of the Holy Spirit? Raise your hand. Look around the room. All right? Beautiful. Thank God for the moves of the Spirit of God within the church. But what do you say we bring it into confirmation? All right, so here's what we're going to do, folks. We're going to just take a couple minutes. I want you just to team up with, the, with two other people. And we're going to put our hands on one another's shoulders, and we're going to real quickly just pray that we come more fully into the confirmational graces that God intended us to have, okay? And we're going to do more of this tonight, but I just want to real quickly just pray with one another. So just get into a, a group of three. Just kind of form a little triad. Put your shoulders on one, your hands on each other's shoulders. And we're going to do this quickly just because we don't have a lot of time. And when you're ready, I'll lead us in prayer, and then I'll give you a minute just to pray whatever you want to pray. And you can sit, you can stand, whatever works for you. So everyone's teamed up. All right, we're going to just pray that we come into the fullness of our confirmational graces. You all ready for this? Everyone just pray with me. Say, come Holy Spirit, and kindle within us the fire of your love. We ask now, in Jesus' name, by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you bring us more fully into our baptismal and confirmational graces. May rivers of living water flow from within us. Fan into flame the gifts of your Spirit. Lord, we want more. Whatever we've received, we ask for more. Come, Holy Spirit. Now just pray over one another for a minute. If you don't know what to say, just say more, Lord, or come, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we just ask that you just come and move. And just bring your church more fully into what you intend for us. And we'll do this more tonight. But for right now, let's just pray over one another and just pray as you feel led to pray. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Lord, I ask you to bring us more fully into Pentecost. Pour forth your Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Drive away everything that's not of you and bring us more fully into what is of you. May we live into the fullness of what you've intended as your church. All right, I'm going to be quiet for about another 30 seconds, and you guys just pray as you feel led to pray. Just make sure it's good. <laughs> Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Let's, uh, let's all pray again together. Say again, come Holy Spirit. Fill the hearts of your faithful. And enkindle within them the fire of your love. Baptize us in your love. Baptize us in your joy. Baptize us in your power. In your grace. Come Holy Spirit. Lord, we just ask you to bless this time.
In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. How we doing? Kind of fun, isn't it? No matter what we've experienced, there's always more. I heard someone say, God is so, much, God is so extravagant, how much sky do we really need? More, Lord, more. There's so much more, right? No matter how many times or how many times you gasp or breathe in, you're never going to suck up all the oxygen. There's always more. That's how extravagant our God is. All right, now we're going to go into a hearing from God. We're doing pretty good. We're doing four days worth of work, and we're already halfway through. We're in day, uh, not four days, two days. We're already in day two. You all ready? All right. So hearing from God. For us to live into the mission of Jesus Christ, it's crucial that we recognize his voice. So Jesus says, he who believes in me will do the things that I've done. What is one of the main things that Jesus did? He did that which he saw and heard his father do and say. Jesus says, I only do that which I see my father doing. I only do that which I hear my father saying. We're to do the same. We're to get to the place as his church, as his people, where we're only doing what we're seeing him doing. And we're just saying what we hear him saying. You go, well, that's overwhelming. I'm not sure I can do that. Well, I agree. I can't do that either. But the Holy Spirit can. And he lives in you. The Holy Spirit, this is catechism. Let me see if I have this here. Yeah, let's jump there. 687. Paragraph 687 of the Catechism says this. No one comprehends the thoughts of God. Well, thank God for that. I don't have to figure out God. No one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Spirit of God knows the thoughts of God. <laughs> yeah. Now, God's Spirit, who reveals God, makes known to us Christ, His Word, his living utterance. But the Spirit does not speak of himself. The Spirit who has spoken through the prophets makes us hear the Father's words. Let me summarize that for you. The Holy Spirit who lives in you, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, 18, do you not know that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? You're the house of God who lives in you. You were bought with a price. What's the price? Christ shed blood. Do you not know that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you? So the Spirit of God lives in you. And if we're not sure about that, we just made sure of it right now as we all prayed for one another to come into the fullness of confirmation. So the Spirit of God lives inside of you. So here's the really good news. The Spirit of God who lives inside of you knows the thoughts of God. And he will reveal to you, just like he did the prophets of old, just like he did Christ himself, he will reveal to you the thoughts of God. So you and I don't have to struggle to say, oh, my gosh, what's God saying? Oh, they just came up to me and said, will you give me a prophetic word? Oh, uh, uh. No. The Scripture just says, be still and know that I'm God. And just to be still and to go, okay, Spirit of God, you know what you want to say to them. Reveal it to me. And it really is that simple. I'll give you a, a Bart's dummy version of prophecy. I've experienced almost every flavor of the body of Christ. Came back to the Catholic Church eight years ago. Was part of interdenominational, non-denominational churches. Traveled for two, three years doing prophetic ministry. And this is my summary of prophecy. Prophecy is simply hearing from God and sharing it. And it's that simple. You say, how can I hear from God? Well, because he lives inside of you. The Spirit of God who lives inside of you will make known the thoughts of God. You say, but I'm not sure I can hear from God. Well, then let's read John 10, 27, where Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. Who's he referring to? That's not much of a compliment, is it? I've heard sheep are kind of dumb and dirty and smelly. 
But he says, my sheep hear my voice. So just humor me a minute and say with me, bah. bah. Nice. All right. So he says, you and I are his sheep. And his sheep hear his voice. So that means you hear his voice. No matter what the enemies told you, or your own doubts or concerns have told you, or your own strivings have told you, you're his sheep, and he makes his voice known to his sheep. And his spirit lives inside of you, and his spirit knows the thoughts of God, and he'll reveal the thoughts of God to you. So let's just renounce the lie that the enemy wants to tell all of us, the lie that I don't hear from God. So say with me, in the name of Jesus, I renounce the lie that I don't hear from God. In the name of Jesus, I announce the truth that Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, and he calls me a sheep. So therefore, I hear his voice. And I announce in Jesus' name that the Spirit of God lives inside of me. And he knows God's thoughts. And he'll reveal his thoughts, and he'll reveal his thoughts to me. Amen. Amen. It really is that simple. John 8, 47. Whoever is from God. If you're from God, raise your hand. Look around. If no one's raising your hand, pray for them afterward. No, I'm kidding you. Okay. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> John 8, 47. You got to be careful coughing these days, don't you? John 8, 47, whoever is from God, say again, I'm from God. I'm from God. Whoever is from God hears the words of God. And my water fell. Whoever is from God, <laughs> whoever is from God hears the words of God. So let's say it again. In the name of Jesus, name of Jesus. I, announce the truth I announce the truth that I'm from God. I've been paid for through the blood of Jesus Christ. I belong to him. And I hear his words. Amen.